Hi everyone, welcome back to Texas Government 2306. Today we are going to continue talking about Texas political culture. So this is part two and we will start with So now we'll talk about Texas demographics. The population of Texas has grown and changed rapidly in the last 160 years. In 1850, the population was 210,000 people. In 1990, the Texas population was 17 million. Thanks to the strong economy of the state, in 2010, Texas had 25.1 million people. There are three factors that accounted for the population growth in the 1990s. The first one is the different birth rates relative to death rates. So we had more people being born relative to the number that were dying. The second one is international immigration, especially from Mexico. And the third is migration from other states. So first we'll speak about Anglos in the state of Texas. Anglos were the dominant group in Texas until the 21st century. European Anglos settled in Texas because of the availability of cheap land. The wave of Anglos who came to Texas brought different values with them and transformed the political culture. By the 1950s, 74% of the Texas population was Anglo. However, by 2010, this number had fallen to 47%. In the state of Texas, most, ex most Hispanics are of Mexican descent. In the early 19th century, about 5,000 people of Mexican descent were living in Texas the Hispanic population has fluctuated over the years, but recent estimates suggest that the Hispanic population stands at about 9.5 million. Initially, most Hispanics worked as laborers in the cotton and ranch industries. However, after World War II, changes in discriminatory labor laws allowed Hispanics to take jobs in the growing Texas urban areas. The political status of Hispanics has changed significantly over time. Various barriers prevented Hispanics from participating in the political system. Only after World War II did the political status of Hispanics improve and this was due to the Hispanic politicians who started to assume positions of importance in urban areas. By the 1980s, the Hispanic population played a major role in state politics. Hispanics were actively courted by both parties and increased their presence in elected office. In 2010, Hispanics accounted for 37% of the population of Texas. Most African Americans entered Texas as slaves. By the end of the Civil War, over 182,000 slaves lived in Texas. This came out to be about a third of the population. While African Americans in Texas were emancipated on June 19, 1865, equality did not exist. Black codes were passed by the local governments and the legislature to restrict the rights of former slaves. African Americans had some opportunities during Reconstruction but their improved status was reversed when Democrats came into power in the 1870s. Segregation became a guiding principle of policy making. In the 1940s and 50s, federal court decisions brought some relief. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 helped open up the political system to African Americans. 
Today, this population is concentrated in East Texas as well as the urban centers of Dallas and Houston, and black political leaders have come to play a major political role in the state's politics. In 2010, African Americans made up 11% of the Texas population. Now the link that you see uh, called Texas Population Projections, if you go to the actual PowerPoint online, you will see that the link should take you to some projected data for the state of Texas in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, the population of the state of Texas is expected to grow exponentially. Now, if you were paying attention to the percentages that I have given you, you will notice that with the numbers that I just discussed, no group of people has a majority in Texas. Anglos constitute a plurality of the Texas population, meaning it is not a majority because it is not over 50%. Texas is one of the youngest states in the Union, and we are not talking about because of its stature as a state. We are talking about the age of its population. What we have found is that about 27% of the population was under 18 as compared to about 24.5% nationally. So what this means is that the state of Texas has a population made up of a lot, a lot of young people. However, Texas population tends to be poorer than the rest of the nation. Despite economic gains in the 1990s, Texas still lags behind much of the country in per capita income. As of 2009, the percentage of the population living below the poverty line was 17% in Texas. The national figure in the same year was 14%. Earlier I asked you to make note of urbanization. Well, here we are. Urbanization is the process by which people move from rural areas to the big city. Conversely, suburbanization is the process by which people move from central city areas and move out to the surrounding areas, the suburbs. Now much of Texas history is linked to ongoing urbanization. This process is largely complete as over 88% of the state's population now resides in urban areas. However, suburbanization continues to spread as city populations spill over into surrounding suburban areas. Most of Texas cities were the product of European settlement. As Spain tried to expand its territorial control and Anglos were given land grants as an inducement to migrate, the areas grew. Anglo settlement brought with it a new language, slavery, Protestantism, and a commitment to free enterprise and democracy. The specific distribution of cities in Texas is largely a product of railway lines. These railway lines were later reinforced or totally taken over by the construction of state and national highways. It is these infrastructure changes that have helped the urban spread in the state of Texas. The Texas political economy we are speaking of the complex interrelations between politics and the economy, as well as the effects on each other. This political, this urban political economy is reflected in the comparison of its three major metropolitan areas. Houston is the largest city in Texas and the fourth largest in the U.S. 
including its surrounding areas. Houston's population was almost 6.1 million in 2010. Economic dreams, segregation, cotton, commerce, railroad, and oil shaped the city's history. With the emergence of the petrochemical industry, Houston became one of the leading energy centers in the world. Census data for 2010 indicates that Anglos account for 28% of the population, Hispanics 42%, and African Americans 22%. Now, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex includes Dallas, Fort Worth, and other smaller cities. The Metroplex is joined by interlocking highways and has an international airport. The railroad, transportation, communication, entrepreneurship, cotton, cattle, oil, manufacturing, and high-tech industries have all shaped the area. While Dallas has a white-collar modern feel, Fort Worth still draws heavily on West Texas culture. San Antonio. San Antonio is Texas' second largest city with a population of approximately 1.32 million as of 2010. The economy is built on military bases, education, tourism, and medical research complexes. It lacks the high-tech industrial jobs of Houston and Dallas, and therefore has a lower average income. So if you stop and consider the three cities that we have up here, look at the breakdown of the demographics of the, of the city of Houston. The number of people that live in San Antonio versus the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Why is it that San Antonio is the second largest versus Dallas-Fort Worth? Well, the saying is nobody lives in Dallas. And that's because they all live in the suburbs, in the small towns that surround the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Everybody goes to work in Dallas but very few people actually live in Dallas. San Antonio, however, Everybody lives in San Antonio. The entire area is growing. It is annexing those rural suburban areas and making them a part of San Antonio proper. So what you can see is that not only is Houston growing, but so is San Antonio. And as you travel the state, you can see the influence of these urban areas. Will the state ever be fully urbanized? No, of course not. We're too big of a state for that to ever happen. But keep an eye on the population and the growth of the three cities that you see here. This is where you find your jobs, where you find your education, where you have your largest concentration of people. Um, this is why the state of Texas is as big as it is. So we will now talk about the beginning of the state of Texas, political culture, um, and the people that have grown the state. First and foremost, culture. As more settlers were drawn to Texas because of the cheap land, the Latino and Native American culture was replaced with the English, Scottish, Irish culture that became the dominant culture. Women in the state of Texas or in the Texas Territory had very few rights. However, remember, Texas was a part of Spain. Of, we were a Spanish territory and Spanish law allowed women to own property. However, they could not vote or serve on juries. When the state of Texas existed as a territory, political parties did not exist. However, we did have feuding factions. Now, a faction is just a group of people. It does not have any designation. 
Um, it is just a group of like-minded individuals. So we had these factions versus parties, right? Nowadays we speak of parties. When Texas first was a territory and then became a nation, what we see is factions. The first faction that you need to note is the pro-Houston faction. This faction wanted annexation for Texas and to have peace with the Native Americans. The second faction was the anti-Houston faction. This faction was led by Mirabeau B. Lamar, who wanted to continue with Manifest Destiny. Now, do any of you know what Manifest Destiny refers to? If you do not, it is the theory that it is God's plan for the United States to spread democracy and capitalism across the continent. There will be a video that will be posted on Canvas, so please be sure you watch the video so that you can understand what this theory considers. Well, not only are we to spread democracy and capitalism across the continent, but along the way we are to eradicate the Native Americans. Texans actually voted for annexation into the United States in 1836. However, the United States at the time did not allow Texas to join the Union until 1845. Why was this the case? Well, the answer is twofold. The first answer is slavery. Texas was at the time a slave state. The second was, or the second reason is that the United States Congress wanted to avoid war with Mexico. And don't forget, we were a part of Mexico. Again, I will add links to Canvas that will give you more information. I'm kind of a history buff, so I like to have all this info so that I can better understand what we are talking about. I will put it and make it available to you, so be sure you check that out. Now the feuding factions, the pro-Houston faction and the anti-Houston faction continued to feud up until the, the 1860s. Now Governor Houston, and for those of you who do not know what Houston I am talking about, I am talking about Sam Houston. He wanted Texas to stay in the Union and not secede, while secessionist forces wanted Texas to join the Confederacy. So we have the pro and anti-Houston factions fighting. They fight up until 1860. And what are we talking about? What time in history are we talking about in the 1860s? What is going on in the country? Well, Houston was outvoted and Texas seceded. Well, how did that turn out for the state of Texas? So now we'll continue with the political progress of the state. First, we'll touch on women. What rights did women have when Texas became a nation? I mentioned that during the last slide. What rights do women have today? Well, first, women had the ability to own property before Texas became a state. But did they have any other rights? No, of course they didn't. Um, it was all left to Anglo men to vote, to sit on juries, um, to own businesses. Women had no rights. So what rights do we have today? Ladies out there, stop and consider what are you able to do? And stop and think of those women that lived when Texas was first starting out as a territory and then a state. Compared to then, we are sitting pretty. Now, the evolvement of voting rights from 1814, or excuse me, from 1914 to 1918, Texas had a governor who nicknamed himself Farmer Jim. His real name was Jim Ferguson. He was impeached and convicted for illegal use of public funds, but that is not the entire story on Farmer Jim. 
The story here is he was against women's suffrage. For those of you who do not know, suffrage means the ability for women to vote. So women campaigned against Farmer Jim and helped to orchestrate his demise. He was replaced by William P. Hobby Sr. Now, does that name sound familiar? For any of those of y'all that like to go to Vegas and like to hop on Southwest, where do you catch that plane? Now, William P. Hobby Sr.'s views were seen as more receptive to women's suffrage. Under Hobby, Texas became the first Southern state to ratify the 19th Amendment. What is the 19th Amendment? Please be sure you know what the 19th Amendment is. For those of you who do not know, the 19th Amendment is the right to vote, women's right to vote. Now, have women made progress in running for office in Texas? Well, that's a loaded question. Yes and no. We have only elected two female governors during the history of Texas. Please make note of these. One was Ann Richards and the other was Miriam Ma Ferguson. Now where have we heard that Ferguson name before? Yes, Miriam was the wife of Farmer Jim. Women were given the right to serve on juries in 1954. In 1972, Texas passed the Texas Equal Rights Amendment. Not even the U.S. federal government has passed this amendment. So in Texas, women have equal rights. Minorities. Was Texas a racist state? How did minorities attempt to overcome this racism? Well, minorities have attempted to overcome racism by forming groups and by using the courts for their causes. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, was founded in 1909. The League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, was formed in Corpus Christi in 1929. So why do you form groups such as these two groups? Well, you do this so that you have someone to advocate for you. And because of this advocation, of this advocating and this supporting of causes, you end up having court cases that m help transform the political climate and help transform policy. So the first case we're going to talk about is Nixon versus Herndon. In this case, Texas was prohibiting African Americans from voting in election primaries. The Supreme Court ruled this was a violation of the 14th and 15th Amendment and states that Texas could not prohibit African Americans from voting in the primaries. So what does Texas do to get around this ruling? Well. Texas turns around and grants authority to the political parties to determine who should vote in their primaries. So the Supreme Court tells Texas that they are in the wrong, so Texas finds a workaround and they abdicate their responsibility to the political parties. Now in Grovey versus Townsend, in 1934, R. R. Grovey, an African American, attempted to vote in the Democratic primary election and was not allowed because of his race. Grovey sued, stating his rights under the 14th and 15th Amendment were violated. At this point, the Supreme Court ruled it was not a violation of his rights because the discrimination was by the Democratic Party itself and the party's restriction had not been authorized or endorsed by the state. So don't forget, the state abdicated its, its responsibilities on the primary elections to the parties.
Smith v. Allwright overturned Grovey v. Townsend. This case said restrictions against African Americans were unconstitutional because even though the Democratic Party was a voluntary organization, the fact that Texas statutes governed the selection of county-level party leaders and the party conducted primary elections under the state authority meant African Americans could vote in the primaries. Remember, these rights given to you by the Constitution were a restriction on what the government could do to you, not individuals. Because the state oversaw the elections, it became a governmental function and therefore African Americans could not be discriminated against. Or in plain English, primaries are a part of the elections process. The elections are run by the government. Therefore, the discrimination is it a question. Was this the end of discrimination in Texas? No, of course not. In 1946, Herman Sweat, an African American, applied for admission to the University of Texas Law School. Can anybody guess what the answer was? Mr. Sweat's application was automatically rejected because of his race. Sweat asked the state courts to order his admission and, and, in response, the university attempted to provide separate but equal facilities for African American law students. The question posed to the court was, did his admission scheme violate the Equal Protection Clause found under the 14th Amendment? The court ruled the Equal Protection Clause required Sweat be admitted to the university. The court decided that the Law School for African Americans, which was scheduled to open in 1947, would have been grossly unequal to the University of Texas Law School. The court said the separate school would be inferior in a number of areas, including faculty, course variety, library facilities, legal writing opportunities, and overall prestige. The last of the court cases is Hernandez versus the state of Texas. This is the only Mexican-American civil rights case heard and decided by the United States Supreme Court during the post-World War II period. In 1950, Pete Hernandez, a migrant cotton picker, was found guilty of murdering Joe Espinoza in Edna, Texas. Hernandez's attorney, Gustavo Garcia, appealed the decision to the Supreme Court by arguing the 14th Amendment guaranteed protection not only on the basis of race, but also class. The state of Texas argued the 14th Amendment covered only Anglos and African Americans and that Mexican Americans were white. The state admitted no person with a Spanish surname had served on any type of jury for 25 years in Jackson County, Texas. But this was simply a coincidence, not a pattern of attitude or behavior. Garcia argued that by not allowing Mexican Americans to serve on juries, they were being treated as a separate class and therefore discriminated against. The court accepted the concept of distinction by class and said that when laws produce unreasonable and different treatment on such a basis, the constitutional guarantee of equal protection is violated. So Hernandez versus the state of Texas is the last of the court cases under political progress. Next we have education and this is just a quick overview of uh, some of the policies of education uh, as we've made political progress. We'll get into education more towards the end of the semester. Education has always been important in Texas, and this has been illustrated since the first constitution covering Texas. There are two things I wish to discuss about education in Texas. First, after World War I, Texas decided to provide free textbooks for public school children. This was our first progressive movement. Our next one came 
in the 1980s under Governor Mark White. Under Governor White, we had three provisions enacted in regards to education. We had no pass, no play, no pass, no teach, and finally, Edgewood versus Kirby in 1989. So no pass, no play, and no pass, no teach are still in existence today. What are these? A lot of you, if y'all have gone to school here in Texas, um, should know about no pass, no play. Now, no pass, no play. This is the limitation of students being able to play sports or participate in extracurricular activities. In other words, if you do not pass your classes, you do not play or you do not participate. And this applied to every single extracurricular activity, whether that be art, drama, band, orchestra, football, soccer, baseball, lacrosse, whatever the case may be. If it was considered extracurricular, you had to pass your classes in order to participate. The second one is no pass, no teach. What this applies to is teachers. Teachers have to pass the state content test in order to teach in K-12 to grades. In other words, it is not enough that you have a college degree. Now you have to have a college degree and be able to pass a state administered test in the grade or in the content course that you will be teaching. If you are teaching early education, pre-K and kindergarten, then you would have to pass a test that dealt with early childhood education. If you wanted to teach high school science, then you had to pass a test that showed your competence in the sciences at the high school level. And this is what is meant by no pass, no teach. The last one is Edgewood versus Kirby. This court case started in 1989, but was not decided until 1993. So it still falls under the 80s. Um, this is better known as the Robin Hood plan because it dealt with equality in school funding. So what Edgewood versus Kirby does, or it did, and it still does, is it takes money from the richer school districts, the richer independent school districts around the state, and distributes it out to the less prosperous school districts. Now we'll get more into the school districts and how they make their money, but if you own a home, then you know where that money comes from. Homeowners are taxed by the school district in which they reside, in which case that money then goes to the school district to provide that school district with resources. So HISD was considered a rich school district and HISD lost money in the process because that money went back to the state in order for the state to distribute it to some of the lesser uh, resourceful uh, school districts when it comes to monetary funds, to actual tax funds. So that is what Edgewood versus Kirby, it is called the Robin Hood plan because you're stealing from the rich to help the poor. Last but not least, we have parties. As I said at the beginning of this topic, uh, in part one, for a hundred years, Texas was a one-party state. Starting in 1873, in response to Republican governors that were forced upon us by the North, uh, this governor was E.J. Davis. Now remember, 73, we're in Reconstruction after the Civil War. So we have been a democratic state. We now have a Republican governor because we are being punished for being a part of the Confederacy. Texas voted from here on out Democrat for every state office. Remember the Republicans are in charge of the North. They want to punish the South for seceding and this is why Texas voted Democratic in every single statewide election. Not only do we see that kind of punishment, but we see the federal government interfere in Texas politics and in Texas government in other ways. So there do appear chinks in the armor of the government. The first was found during the Tide Lands Controversy. Tide Lands Controversy. So the Tide Lands Controversy dealt with oil. Oil was found off the coast of Texas. 
Texas claimed the land the oil was found on because they wanted the money. Can you guess who else claimed the land? Of course, the federal government said it was on their land. Anyway, after three Supreme Court decisions against the state, three acts of Congress in favor of the state, two presidential vetoes against the state, and a major issue in a presidential campaign, the state finally won the victory. So you're probably asking yourself, what does this have to do with the parties? Well, the Democrats were in charge at the national level. In other words, the president was a Democrat. This upset the Texas Democrats that somebody in their party at a higher level of office would try to screw them over. The actions by the Democrats at the federal level actually created a slip in the Texas Democratic Party and created the Shivercrats. Shivercrats. The Shivercrats were Democrats who would vote Democratic at the state and local level but vote Republican at the federal level in retaliation to the federal government action regarding the Tidelands controversy. Remember, we do not forgive nor we forget, right? So the Democrats in Texas were getting back at the Democrats in the federal government. Now, Democrats still controlled the state, but their grasp was slipping. In 1972, Governor Briscoe was elected. He was a Democrat, so this was not a surprise. What was surprising was the fact this was the first Democrat elected governor without a majority vote. Remember, we discussed majority and plurality in regards to ethnicity. The Democrats had never won a race with less than a majority. As if it were a sign that things were changing, Republican William P. Clement won election to the governor's office in 1979. So a mere seven years later, we have a Republican in office. This was the first Republican governor since E.J. Davis. Remember, E.J. Davis became our Republican governor in 1873. So, a hundred years later, we have our first elected, our first elected Republican governor. So the Republicans think they have made it to the promised land and are now again a force in Texas. At this point in time, they were wrong. Governor Clements is defeated by Governor White, a Democrat, but in a sign things may change again in 1986, Governor Clements is re-elected. In 1990, Democrat Ann Richards is elected governor, only the second female to be elected, but Republicans are starting to win statewide elections. Now George W. Bush, does this sound familiar? is elected after Ann Richards, and in 1998, Republicans win every single statewide office. In 2002, the Republican Party gains control of both chambers of the Texas legislature. So, if that doesn't sound like a soap opera or a drama, I don't know what does. But be prepared, because this is state government, and especially Texas government, it gets to be juicy sometimes. Um, this ends this first part of, or this first topic of Texas political culture. This, of course, was the second part of the topic. I look forward to talking to you again for the second topic in Government 2306. Please be sure to email me if you have any questions or any comments or if anything that you need clarified. Uh, you'll find my email, of course, on the syllabus and everywhere on Canvas. Uh, I look forward to hearing from y'all, and uh, y'all have a good day. Bye.